Hey, so hi everybody. So uh, mine's a little bit more theoretical than the other talks you've seen. So um, hopefully you can bear with me on that. So um, lots of places in the world are really bursting with biodiversity. So we have these certain areas that are just packed full of species, and we often refer to these as biodiversity hotspots. And these hotspots are often associated with two key um, habitats. The first is being rainforests, which are estimated to hold between 40 and 75% of all species on Earth, mostly because of the insects that are there. Um, and then coral reefs, which are estimated to hold around 25% of all marine species. So these are really amazing places and really are bursting with biodiversity. But then we also have places like this, so there's really not much there at all. And really what my research aims to try and understand is how this fundamental discrepancy can arise. So how can we have some places that are full of species and other places that just don't have much there at all? Um, so what we do already know is we, we know pretty well uh, which places do have lots of species and which places don't. And that is pretty helpful for conservation. So it helps us target conservation action. So obviously it's a lot easier with limited conservation resources to try and conserve one of these hotspots because we get sort of the maximum number of species conserved in one go. But um, the issue with this is that we've got uh, lots of change going on on our Earth at the moment, as you've already heard. So we've got rises in temperature, sea level rise, all this kind of stuff. And we've also got massive environmental changes uh, coming through from human development. Um, and all of this uh, adds up to uh, cause species to move around as they try and keep track with the changing environment. And each species moves a different amount and will like to track a different type of environment to each other. And all of these individual species changes then add up to alter global biodiversity patterns. And what this means for long-term conservation is that perhaps where the hotspots of biodiversity are now uh, might not be the places where they are in the future. So we really need to understand what's going on and how biodiversity is created and maintained. So I'm working on this using coral reefs. So um, this is a map of coral species richness in the Indo-Pacific. So the red areas have really high number of species. So some of those reefs have over 600 species. Um, but some of them, so going down to the blue is where we have less species. And it goes down to just about 10 in some places. So even within those top habitats, we have massive variability in how many species we actually have. Okay, so to tackle this question, we really need to think about how can species number in one place change over time. So if we imagine we've got our coral reef there, um, we can think about how we can increase the number of species, and one of these can be immigration. So species can move in from neighbouring reefs. And the second key process that can add to species number is speciation, so the birth of a new species on that reef. And then equally we can lose species number as well. And this can be by emigration, so they just happen to leave that reef, or through extinction. So we've got these four key processes that we want to look at. Um, but just you know, in, in contradiction to what sort of more applied people can do, where they can just, you know, they could manipulate these things, we can't really do that. So you can imagine we can't just go and uh, make a load of species extinct just for our own personal knowledge gain to see what happens wouldn't really be very ethical or very feasible probably. So instead what we can do is we can turn to mathematical models. <laughs> so don't worry because you don't have to understand this, it's fine. Um, so what we can do is we can use these math, mathematical models to create simplified versions of the real world. And when we've created these <coughs> versions uh, we can actually simulate those processes going on. So we can actually kill off fictional species within our simulated worlds. And this allows us to test what those processes can do if we play around with them. So we've got our four processes up there. And um, if we can figure out the probability of these happening over a certain amount of time, that could be really useful. And then we can chuck that all into a computer. So we can tell our computer, for example, that perhaps we've got a 10% chance of a species going extinct over one year. And then we get our computer to simulate this going on for multiple years and get it to report back the number of species we're left with at the end. So if we imagine this is a, a reef, not a very uh, pretty one, obviously, but, uh, and we start off with a few different species of fish. So each coloured species there is a, it, each coloured fish is a different species. Um, 
So it starts moving, so each time step, our computer is using these probabilities to figure out how many species are disappearing and how many species are uh, being created. And this gives us a final number of species. And if we simulate this going on across multiple places over time, what it can give us, it can give us a, a big overall pattern. And then we can compare this pattern to what we actually see in real life and see if it fits or not. Um, so using this technique, we've already found that um, species tend to accumulate in the center of a region over time. And this is the case even when the environment is the same everywhere and when we place the species randomly to begin with. So this is quite an important bit of fundamental understanding of biodiversity. And you can see there it's somewhat true for our coral species, but it doesn't explain everything that's going on. So the next step what I've been working on recently is to try and um, improve these models. And one thing that's been lacking in them so far is that they haven't included any interactions between species. So they've been assuming nothing's going on. But we know that's not true. So clearly species compete for things like light, shelter and food on a regular basis and they eat each other. So you know, they do interact quite a lot. So we've added those into the model and we've just recently found that adding these interactions in better um, allows the model to recreate these kinds of patterns that we see. And what this suggests is that species interactions could be really important on a large scale for controlling biodiversity. So um, this can help us understand how biodiversity hotspots are created and maintained and also it can ultimately help inform conservation. So more specifically, um, it might be able to give us an idea of which hotspots are going to break up in the future as species move away, um, where new hotspots might appear, and also how these species are actually going to reshuffle around the world. So thank you.